They were lured to a motel room and savagely beaten. And the question still remains, who is Tom? Hello, true crime murderers. This is the case of Tom Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised. story happened in Nashville, Tennessee in September of 1992. 21-year-old Jeremy Rolfs was a student and he attended Middle Tennessee State and he also worked as a video editor at a local Nashville music company. Well, in September of 1992, he would put out an ad for a new Apple computer. It was at the time a top of the line uh, computer system and they were going to be selling it for $30,000. On October 7th, 1992, Jeremy Rolfs gets a phone call from a man calling himself Tom Johnson. Tom says, I'm very interested in this computer and I would like to come see it. And so Jeremy sets up a meeting for Tom to come into the studio and take a look at a demonstration of the computer. And Tom Johnson, or the man claiming to be Tom Johnson, does in fact come into the studio. Jeremy sits down with them. He shows them how the whole computer setup works and demonstrated it and Tom was like, great, I want one, I'll buy it. And they agreed at a price of about $31,000. $31,000, I bought my laptop for like a few hundred bucks. <laughs> so Tom asked Jeremy, hey, can you please deliver this computer system to me in Marietta, Georgia? And this was, you know, hundreds of miles away from Nashville. Jeremy said, yeah, absolutely, I can do that. So on October 24th, 1992, Jeremy loads up this new computer system into his truck and tagging along with him is his fiance, Heather Uffelman. She was a 22-year-old student at MTSU. She wanted to go with uh, Jeremy for a couple of reasons. One, Jeremy at that point had just been up for like 30 plus hours working on projects and she was afraid he might fall asleep at the wheel, and so she wanted to be on the you know ride with him in case he needed a break that she could take over, and also just to keep him awake. But also, Jeremy and Heather were really close. They loved each other very much. Um, Heather was this, this kind of fun-loving, excitable young woman, very intelligent, not a mean bone in her body, and she enjoyed spending every moment she could with Jeremy. And that's another reason why she wanted to go, because they love taking trips together. It was just a, a fun thing for them to do. So she joined them. Unfortunately, uh, none of them would know that that would be a fatal decision. So Jeremy and, I mean, Heather were going to be staying at the Knights Inn, which was located off the I-75 in Marietta. They arrived about 7.30 a.m. They reached out to Tom at his office and said, hey, you know, we're in town now. Can you give us directions to this complex where your business is at. And Tom's like, you know what? The directions are really complicated to get here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I already booked a motel room myself. So how about you guys come here and we'll do the computer exchange there. I'll have the president of my company. Um, he'll also come out after me to just sort of verify everything and we'll get the deal done. And Jeremy was like, okay, that's fine. And so they, they drive over to the motel room where Tom was staying. And when they got there, uh, I guess Tom's, or he claimed the president of his company or his coworker or whatever, was running late and wouldn't be there for a little bit longer. And so Heather and Jeremy were like, all right, well, we're starving. We just drove a long way. We're gonna go get breakfast. And so they did that. Then after like an hour or two, they come back to the motel to you know meet Tom. Like, Tom tells them, my boss just called or my coworker just called and he's still running a little late, but he's gonna be here very, very soon. And he asked, hey, Jeremy, are you okay with this? Like, could we just load the computer into my car now just to get it over with? And then we'll go back into the room and just hang out until, you know, my coworker gets here. Jeremy's like, okay, that's fine. So Jeremy, along with Tom, unloads this computer system from the back of his truck and puts it into Tom's vehicle. Once they load it up, and by the way, the images I'm showing, most of them are recreations, obviously. But once they load it up, they go back into Tom's motel room and they sit there for about 20 to 30 minutes and just sort of talk and hang out, get to know each other, do small talk, that kind of thing. But after some time, Jeremy's like, listen, I'm super tired. 
I've been up for a long time, just drove a really long way, and I just want to get this done. Is your guy going to be here soon? And he's like, can we just, you know, exchange the money now? And you can just tell your, your boss or your coworker that everything was fine. When all of a sudden, Tom Johnson completely changes his demeanor. He goes from this really like talkative, helpful, friendly guy to this just immediately turns into like this dark person. Um, he pulls out a gun and he points it at both of them and says, there's not gonna be a deal. The deal's over. So at gunpoint, Tom tells Jeremy, give me your money clip, give me everything you have on you. You know, Heather, give me your jewelry, give me all the money you have on you. And then after that, he at gunpoint tells Heather to pull the sheets off of the bed. So she takes the comforter off and then the white sheet underneath it. He says, put them on the ground. And then he commands both of them to get into their own sheet and wrap themselves up in it. He tells them as they're doing this, don't worry, your company, I'm sure you'll get insurance money for this. Basically stating that, you know, this was a robbery. So I'm sure your company will offer some kind of insurance money. He then tells them both, you guys are both gonna be fine. I'm not gonna hurt you, but he immediately changed his tune. All of a sudden, Jeremy can recall this buzzing sound in his head and everything, the room began to spin um, rapidly to him. And that's because Tom Johnson, whoever he is, just struck Jeremy over his skull with a hammer. And Jeremy is just like completely disoriented, but he's still alert and you can kind of still see Tom. Tom then goes over to Heather and Jeremy can see Tom lift the hammer and smash Heather over her head. And he says at that point, Heather lets out a blood curdling scream that will haunt him for the rest of his life. It was this just horrifying sound that came from her. And he immediately said to her, stop screaming and he'll leave us alone. And then Tom comes back over to Jeremy and strikes Jeremy over the head again. He then goes back over to Heather, Heather and begins to repeatedly bash her over her head multiple times. And then Jeremy can hear the door opening and then closing. And after a few minutes, he is able to get up. Everything is completely just, he's so disoriented. He's in extreme pain. He's got blood rushing down his head over his eyes. And he looks over at Heather and he sees that she is motionless. Her sheet is covered in blood. She's covered in blood. She's not breathing, moving, anything. And at that point, he runs out of the motel room where he gets help and they call police. Um, Tom is long gone. The computer is gone. There was no money exchanged and they were both viciously attacked. An ambulance takes Heather, brings her to a hospital, but about two or three hours after she arrives, she is unfortunately pronounced dead her skull had been completely crushed in. Jeremy was um, admitted to the hospital as well. He was there for several days, but they were able to basically bring him back. And he was able to leave the hospital around October 27th or 28th or so. But he had permanent um, issues. He now had permanent hearing loss. He would suffer from vertigo and he had extreme PTSD. Jeremy can recall to police, he recalled the entire attack. He said afterwards he did see Tom take a cloth and wipe down all the surfaces in the motel room before he left the room. They did dust for fingerprints, they found nothing. They were also able to recover the murder weapon, which was a hammer. The hammer still had the plastic around the top of it as it was probably just purchased. It was a brand new looking hammer. It still had the little price tag of the UPC hanging off of it. But unfortunately, it was such a common hammer that they could not figure out where it was purchased from. And this was also before they had CCTV everywhere. And so even if they found the store, doesn't really know if they were gonna able to like see the person who bought it. But there was no, they didn't have any like credit card paper trails or anything. There was no fingerprints on the hammer because he had wiped them clean. And Jeremy was able to give a pretty detailed description of Tom Johnson and they came up with a composite drawing and they immediately would circulate this composite to the media, put it in the newspapers to see if anybody knows who this guy is. I mean, they obviously at this point believe that Tom Johnson is not the guy's real name, that this guy did not work at whatever company he claimed he worked at because all the information he gave to Jeremy, Jeremy gave to police, would look into it and nothing could be verified. Whatever phone number he called from, they couldn't trace it. They didn't know where it came from. 
this guy, Tom was, or whatever his name was, was really good at covering up his tracks. He knew what he was doing. He knew to hide everything to get rid of all the potential evidence. They do know that he was driving a dark brown or a black cherry Dodge Dynasty. And Jeremy said his that Tom's vehicle had a red interior, like red carpeting. And it did have Tennessee license plates. Tom was in his late 20s, but more than likely his mid 30s. He was about five foot 10, maybe six foot, weighed roughly 165 pounds. He had sandy brown hair at the time, he was clean shaven, and he may wear glasses, but they weren't sure if the guy wearing glasses, like if those were real glasses or not, or if it was just like a disguise. Tom was wearing a really expensive looking pair of boots that was clearly made from alligator skin or possibly snake skin. Tom was someone who was really good at pretending to be someone else. He was very good at putting on a performance, but the reality is, is that Tom was an incredibly cold and calculating individual. He gave absolutely no cares in the world about the violence he took upon Jeremy and Heather. He did it with ease. He did it without thinking. He just did it. He is someone who could easily manipulate people and was able to put on that performance to make people trust him and believe him. The computer he stole was an Apple Quadra 950, which was used at the time for desktop publishing and videotape editing. It had a four gigabyte, a four gigabyte hard drive, 30 megabytes of RAM, and a, and a 125 megabyte opt optical drive. The uh, CPU serial number was num uh, pound sign F62164JW671. The monitor was a 24 inch super high resolution. Uh, color display with the serial number of 92020501. And obviously those computers are probably way gone and probably destroyed and they probably are no longer out there, but just in case, you never know. Maybe someone broke down those serial numbers, who knows? Maybe someone could pinpoint it, you never know. Another thing that police found very strange was that Tom had a gun. Like he, that's how he got them to cooperate with him. He pulled out a gun and why didn't he use it to shoot them? That was very strange to them. Why did he use a hammer to hit him over the head? I think one potential reason, and I'm just speculating here, but it's a lot easier for police to track down, say, a gun. Um, they can pinpoint uh, the gun a bullet came from. Guns will leave behind, you know, evidence like the bullet itself and also maybe shell casings. And so maybe Tom felt that that was just not the correct path to go if he was planning to murder these two people, that a hammer would be better um, because maybe he paid it with cash and they'll never be able to trace it. They won't be able to know where it came from and he wiped it of any physical evidence of himself. In their investigation, police discovered that roughly an hour before the murder happened, before this attack happened, an unknown mystery woman enters the lobby of this motel. She tells the clerk behind the counter that hey, can you please go check out, you know, room number, whatever it was, which would have been Tom Johnson's room. She says there's a commotion going on there, loud noises, I'm concerned about what's happening in there. The clerk behind the desk said, well, we can't get involved in domestic issues because that's what he kind of assumed it was. But the thing is, is at that time, Heather and Jeremy were actually out to breakfast. They weren't in the room. And so what police think is that this woman may have actually been an accomplice of Tom Johnson and that she was going to go along with this plan, but then she found out that he was planning to kill them. And so maybe that was her trying to tell someone without telling someone, you know, go look at this room, get police involved, something. But they also don't know for sure. That woman has never come forward to police. And that's, that's, they don't really know, they know nothing about her. She never gave a name or anything. But unfortunately, the murder of Heather Uffelman and the attempted murder of Jeremy Rolfs has remained unsolved. In 1994, there was a potential sort of maybe break in the case. They got a suspect. In 1994, 49-year-old Tom Steeples became a potential suspect in this case. In April of 1994, this man, Tom Steeples, he murdered a couple in a motel room. He lured them to this motel room. He lured them there, and this happened in Nashville, Tennessee. He lured them there with the promise of a music career or a music label. The couple was Rob and Kelly Phillips. Both of them were also beaten to death. I'm not sure what the weapon was, if it was a hammer or anything, I don't know. But they were beaten to death. 
just like Heather and just like the attempted murder of Jeremy. In 1993, Tom Steeples murdered another person, a man named Ronald Bingham, also in Nashville, Tennessee. Years before all of this, Tom Steeples had um, also sexually assaulted and attempted to kill a young woman. Now, the composite drawing that Jeremy was able to come up with for his attacker of Tom Johnson, if you take away Tom Steeples' mustache, uh, you definitely can see a resemblance. The vehicle that Tom Steeples drove around all of this time was a vehicle with Tennessee license plates, and it matched the description of the car Jeremy gave that Tom Johnson was driving. When that name came up, when Tom Steeples' name came into this, Jeremy said, hey, can I see a photo of Tom Steeples? And I can tell you right now if that's your guy or not. But for, I don't understand why. I don't know why. But police did not show Jeremy the photo of Tom Steeples. And I think that was because, well, they said that at that time when his name came up, they couldn't say Tom Steeples was their suspect in the Heather and Jeremy case, and they didn't consider him a suspect. And so they said, we don't need to show you the, the uh, photo of him because we don't think he's the guy. Why not? Uh, why not? <laughs> it's a little strange, but... So Tom Steeples was out and about. He was roaming free in 1992 when the murder of Heather took place and this attack happened. But he was arrested sometime in 94 or so and he was charged with three total murders, the, the three other ones I told you about, which again, one of them was extremely dead on the same thing as Heather and Jeremy. But in July of 1994, Tom Steeples apparently ended his own life with a deliberate drug overdose in his jail cell. And so with that, he never went to trial for the other three murders and he was never named a suspect in the murder of Heather Uffelman and the attempted murder of Jeremy. Jeremy would later go on to join the Peace Corps. I mean, he did so in the telecommunications area. But on March 31st, 1997, Jeremy Rolfs was uh, killed in a tragic car accident when a driver drove into Jeremy's uh, vehicle from the front because that driver had fallen asleep behind the wheel. Jeremy Rolfs was just 27 years old. Jeremy was never the same after after what he saw. I don't know anyone who would be. I mean, not only was he struck in the head, but what he described he heard um, in terms of Heather uh, was horrifying. And that's probably something that was never going to escape his mind. I mean, he even said in an interview, he was interviewed on Unsolved Mysteries, his identity wasn't revealed at that point, so they did the whole silhouette thing. They didn't want potentially this Tom Johnson person to see that he was still alive, know where he is, that kind of thing. But since Jeremy has passed on, you know, his name has been put back out there. But, I mean, just what he saw Tom doing to Heather, the sound of him hitting her skull, the sound of her scream, and what he physically saw with her skull, like, caved in. I mean, nobody should ever have to see that. And that's going to leave a permanent scar on a person forever and then just a few years later he dies tragically himself it's just sad it's sad everything he went through is just it's horrible tom steeples died never being named a suspect in heather uffelman's murder it does sound like he is he sounds like the right guy there was no physical evidence to put him there and why they never showed the photo to jeremy i will never understand and, you know, maybe they weren't going to think it was reliable given the trauma that Jeremy had to his skull. Um, he, you know, did have some issues from this. I mean, he was struck over the head with a hammer multiple times. So maybe they weren't even going to consider an identification reliable. But what would it have hurt to be like, you know, show Tom's picture in a sea of other pictures, right? And see if Jeremy picks out Tom Soto. That's how you would do it. Don't just show him a photo just of Tom Steeples and say, is this the guy? Put it in a lineup like you normally would do. Why Again, why they didn't do that, I don't know. I, it's just so baffling to me. But it wouldn't have mattered anyway because once his name came up in this investigation, it was 1994 when his name came into this investigation because of all the other murders he committed. So with everything going on, Tom would have been dead within a few months anyway. And so it wouldn't have mattered if he identified him or not, I guess. But you would still have the answer of like, okay, that's definitely the guy. He's dead now. He can't hurt anyone. But now we don't know. Now we'll never know if it was him. And because of how thorough this Tom Johnson person was, he wiped down everything. There was no fingerprints. There was no DNA. There was no paper trail. 
There was no cameras. There was nothing. Whoever Tom Johnson was got away with committing this murder. If it was Tom Seeples, he did technically get away with it. He really got away with all the murders. He didn't ever have to face actual justice. And you know, all you can really hope is death was painful, that it was uncomfortable at least, because he did for sure kill three people. But maybe, just maybe, that there is a possibility out there that someone else did this, that it wasn't Tom Steeples. Maybe that person is still alive out there, wandering around. So somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information on the murder of Heather Uffelman, or the identification of who Tom Johnson truly was, even if it's Tom Steeples, you need to please come forward to the police. You can report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have, just have to say what you know. So please reach out to the police or sheriff's departments in Marietta, Georgia with whatever information you may know. And perhaps that there may still be a chance that Heather Uffelman could get the justice she rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe to the channel if you like true crime. And also follow me over on TikTok where I tell shorter form true crime stories. The link to my TikTok is in the description in the, of the video below in the link tree. In that link tree, you will also find my case list. It's public. You can scroll through it. It's alphabetical for the most part. And if you see a name on there already, you don't have to recommend that to me because it's already there. I pick my cases at random. But if there is a case you would like me to cover and you don't see it on that list, just send me a really quick email. My email is listed below. All I really need to know is the name of the case or the victim, the killer, where it happened, and maybe the year it happened. That way it's easier to find. Like I said, I pick my cases at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually at some point. So, but uh, that is it for this case in this video, True Crime Maroonies. And so until the next time, ta-ta for now.